time for us to get started this morning in our Sunday School class. We're glad you're here. Welcome to every one of you. Um, we're going to continue last Sunday's lesson. Uh, so we're dividing one lesson into two parts. But I am going to give you some review uh, from last week in order to pick up the train of thought with some of the main headings. <clears throat> Perhaps a word of uh, comment on those headings, but we'll try to be brief so that we can get to the new material and uh, finish this particular lesson. Our uh, text for these lessons is to be found in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we're using this as a foundational verse to build on it in terms of what we're now calling the private means of grace. Perhaps you would hear it referred to many times as my devotions. Uh, sometimes you might hear it called personal time of worship or, as we've said, the private means of grace. All of these are good terms when referring to that time when you get along with God. Be that early in the morning, be it during the day, be it at night before you go to bed, whenever that time might be, it's the time when you spend time with God. One of the things that we emphasized last week was this matter of having a structured time. Time and place to meet with God. But what do you do at that time? Uh, do you doze off? Fall asleep? Are you alert? Do you have a method? Do you have a system that will guide you to make the best use of that time so that at the end of that time of your personal devotions you come away having profited from the Word of God. There's been some real benefit to your soul from what you've learned, appropriated, and that you will be attempting by God's grace to put into practice. I emphasize again and again the necessity for structure in terms of your time with God. If you were to embark upon a course of lifting weights, and this would be more particularly interested to the young men or even older men in our congregation, but you're going to uh, start a program of weightlifting in order to tone up your muscles, perhaps gain some muscle weight, I can well assure you that unless you have a program, a system that you're going to follow rigidly, you'll not see any results. You can walk around the gym, you can pick up a, barbell, a dumbbell, you can pick up a couple of barbells, lay them down, get on the treadmill for five minutes, whatever, but if there's no structure, order, planned, in your exercise program of lifting weights. You can do that for weeks, months, or longer, never see any results. And that can happen with your personal devotions. You can go day after day, week after week, month after month, with virtually little benefit. And many times the root cause for that is because you don't know how to go about it you don't know how to structure your time. You don't know how to make the best use of your reading of the God's Word or even in your praying. So how did we base this need of structure? Not just from a very practical issue, but we based it on the fact that the God whom we worship is a God of order, a God of structure. And that order and structure should be reflected in our life. 
not just in our devotions, but in other areas of our life, the way we maintain the house, the, may, the way we maintain our car, the way we do our job, uh, the way we do a lot of things, should be orderly and structured, because God is. Now, if you take all of the activities, various areas of activities, and responsibilities that we have, and say, yes, they should be structured. I want to put your personal time with God on top of that list. If anything we do should be structured, that should be structured. Because we're coming before a God of order. What would please him as we come to him? Some order in our time with him. Well, we could mention some other headings, but I will forego that. And then we dealt with the, the uh, area of heart preparation. That's part of the order. Focusing upon God, that's part of the order. Then we mentioned about reading God's Word. We should read God's Word inquisitively, asking some questions. How does this apply to my life? What does this passage teach me about God? Is there something I need to obey here? Is there a precept uh, to my life? Or is there a promise that I can lay hold of that will encourage me and strengthen me? Uh, how is God trying to change my thinking in this area? So those are cool very good questions that you can use or are others but uh, then those questions will help us now we began dealing with the topic of meditation that is giving effort to meditating upon the word of God uh, the psalmist said blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. Meditate. You see, there's more to reading than just threading the words through our eyes. There's more to hearing a Sunday school lesson or a sermon than just hearing it with our ears. There needs to be a grasp of it, and then we need to do something with it. Uh, we read in Luke 9, 44, Let these words sink into your ears. That goes beyond the surface. There is surface hearing. There is in-depth hearing. Let these words sink into your ears. Um, David is a good example to us of the art of meditation. Uh, he was a man who knew what it was to meditate. He was a man that was always pretty much in a situation of adversity and trial. Uh, there was a time when false lies, false reports and lies were being told about him. And David says, rather than succumb to self-pity, I'm going to meditate in the Word of God. You see the contrast there? We're tempted to give in to our feelings, tempted to uh, bypass our responsibilities. David said, not going to let that bother me. I'm going to meditate in God's Word. We said last week, that there are two words translated in scripture that we translate meditate. The first one, strangely enough, is to mutter. Uh, the other word is to bow down. That is to let the weight of the meaning of that word, God's word, weigh upon us heavily. Now, there are two definitions we gave of what it means to meditate. It is the duty or exercise 
of religion whereby the mind is applied to the solemn contemplation of revealed realities for the practical use and purpose. So we're dealing with revealed realities and it's applying the mind to those realities in order that we might discover the practical use of that truth in my life. The second definition is that it is an exercise of the mind which recalls a known truth to be ruminated upon until the nutritious part is abstracted and fitted to the purpose of life. Let me quote for you very quickly the answer to the question number 157 in the Westminster Larger Catechism. How is the Word of God to be read? The Holy Scriptures are to be read with a high and reverent esteem of them, with a firm persuasion that they are the very Word of God, and that He only can enable us to understand them, with desire to know, believe, and obey the will of God revealed in them, with diligence and attention to the matter and scope of them, with meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. Well, we spoke on some other issues. We summarized our time last week by saying it rivets the truth to the spirit and to the mind of Christ. Meditation is more than precise memorization. Memorization is an aid, but meditation goes far beyond that. Now, this brings us to some new material. Meditation gives you the opportunity of comparing Scripture with Scripture. You see, Scripture is its best interpreter, its own interpreter. And that's one of the rules of hermeneutics, or the proper way of interpreting Scripture, is for Scripture to give light on other Scripture. So there's a real benefit as you spend time thinking about that particular truth, God then, by the Holy Spirit, can cause you to think of other truths that you have memorized or read and see the connection between those truths, which gives us much benefit. Then meditation will afford us the opportunity, I like the way this is expressed, to walk through the corridors of life and expose any lack of conformity to the truth. You see how picturesque that is? It's like walking through the corridors of your life, your domestic duties, your employment, your personal entertainment in life. On and on and on. Various, various areas of your life. And meditation can be a tool to discover these are some areas that need to be brought into greater conformity to the truth of God's Word. Well, of course, when you see that and are aware of it, then do something about it. Do the changes. Bring about the changes. And what's going to happen? Your life, outwardly and inwardly, will be more and more conformed to God. What was the, the purpose behind God's eternal choice in eternity past of those whom he would save? That they would be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. More and more conformed to God's revealed will and be like our Lord. Well, the Word of God, prayer and meditation are the essential tools to accomplish that. 
so that there is spiritual growth, spiritual maturity taking place. How much growth and spiritual growth and maturity has taken place in your life the past month, six months, or year? You know how little kids are. They want you to make a mark on the doorway somewhere on the wall of how tall they are, right? And then uh, a few weeks, months later, they want you to measure them again. Why? To determine how much they, they've grown. Well, if we could do that with you spiritually, and I could take you in there to the office and say, this is where you were last month or six months ago, but where are you now spiritually? In spiritual maturity, spiritual growth in the knowledge and the practice of God's word. How much real progress has been taking place? Now this brings us to prayer. Again, meditation is one of the fundamental helps in giving direction to our time of praying. We want our prayers to exceed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Well, those, that might be a good prayer for a little child to learn. Dear ones, our pray, our prayer time needs to go far beyond that, obviously. Now, first on the list, in terms of praying, is that of praying for things not, I'm sorry, praying for things we ought not to pray for? That's a problem. What did James say about it? You ask and receive not because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So in that particular case, what's happened? Our prayers are being formulated outside of the will of God, the revealed will of God. Many times I don't know the will of God about a certain particular need or issue. But praying and saying, Lord, your will be done. You see, encompassing that request with a submission to the will of God, whatever that will might be. But many times we can pray again and again according to the will of God because I'm familiar with God's will. I have seen it. I know it. I've meditated upon it. I've benefited from it, and I can turn that truth, that revealed will of God, into prayer. I've already mentioned this many times, but take Psalm 25. I'm just using that as an example. That is a prayer. It is an inspired prayer. I can go through that prayer and take out various aspects of requests and pray those very things back to God. O oh Lord, lead me in thy truth. Is that according to the will of God? Indeed. And I can pray that. What about Psalm 51? That is a prayer. It is a prayer of confession. Is it God's will for me to confess my sins? And acknowledge them? Yes. Is there a way of doing that? Yes. Psalm 51 is a pattern of biblical confession of prayer. I'm not as I've seen. So we can benefit from that and pray that prayer and we're praying according to the will of God. Now, sometimes there's no real motivation for prayer. That happens. But we've already pointed out that spending time profitably from God's Word provides us with fuel for prayer. Many things we can pray about as we spend time in the Word of God. Now, let me suggest some things that we can pray for. 
What about praying that God would conform us more to the image of Christ? Not a good request? Sure. Pray. God, conform me more to your will, to your word, to the image of your son. Here's another request. Pray that God would give more compassion for the lost. A heart of compassion for those who are outside of Christ. To pray for them. To witness to them. To be concerned about the fact that that is a never dying soul that will spend eternity in hell. Do we have any real compassion? Can we pray that God would give us more compassion? Let me suggest another thing you might pray for. More sensitivity to sin. We can, living our, out our daily life, in the routine of our life, soaked or in the influence of the world that is around us, living in an age in when there is callousness about sin, do you realize that can affect you? You can become callous to it. It's everyday stuff. You see it in the news. You see it on the television. Whatever. Throughout daily life. And we can become hardened. Why not pray, Lord, Give me a greater sensitivity to sin. Lord, help me to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And that is a very important request if we are to see progress in our life in dealing biblically with sin. To become very aware of it. And not to uh, underestimate the power of sin. Not to underestimate the power of the world uh, and the influence that it has even upon the believer. Well, here's another request. What about including in your time of prayer the extending of God's kingdom upon the earth? And including in that, your church, other biblical churches, efforts for evangelism and missions fall into that kind. And what you're doing is praying, thy kingdom come. Ever hear that before? Yeah, that's the Lord's prayer. And we have biblical basis to pray that God's kingdom would be established in the hearts of men. What about praying for God's name to be hallowed and glorified in your life and in the life of other believers and in the life of our Well, we uh, mentioned a while ago the motivation for prayer and uh, what motivated David. Well, many things motivated David. And David prayed as an extension of his meditation. So again, we come back to the duty meditating upon the Word of God, and then it provides motivation, many things for which to pray. Now, I want us to uh, open our Bibles to uh, 
Psalm 103. Psalm 103, a psalm of David. I want us to kind of just take a look at this psalm. Psalm 103, and let's look at verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Praying is a good time to stop and think about the benefits God has given us. Think of the benefits that God has bestowed upon us. Would that not motivate you to pray? And thank God for those benefits? The comforts of a home? The convenience of a car? Communication? A telephone? Perhaps sometimes we're not so thankful for that. <laughs> it bothers us more than it does. But many, many, many innumerable benefits that God has given us. But I want you to look at verse 3. And what's he, what's he doing in verse 3? Do you know? He's meditating. What's he meditating on? Just what we emphasize. The benefits. David says in verse 2, don't let me forget those benefits. But in verse 3, he begins to meditate and focus upon benefits. What's the very first benefit in David's meditation? Pardon from iniquity. Pardon from sin. Wonderful benefit from God. He meditates more. Who heals all your diseases. Think about the fact, the benefit of being blessed with good health day after day. I went to St. Vladimir yesterday in the hospital. And again, I was vividly reminded of how much we should be thankful for him. As I walked down the halls of the hospital, many of the doors were open, and you see people, room after room after room, and then you step to the window and look at how many floors and buildings are in the hospital complex, and realize it's floor after floor, building after building, with many who are laying flat on their back. Sick. We and we thank that God's blessed us with the help. Is that a benefit? Yes. Verse four. Who redeems your life? much time thanking God for redeeming our life, our soul, out of the pit of destruction. David says, he took me out of the pit and set my feet up on the rock and established my goings and put a new song in my heart. One of the things that really is sobering, and that is as I deal with the prison ministry, many times these men will write long letters and share with me what has happened to them from the time they were a child. And I can tell you, some of these men were in the pits, deep in the pits. What a glorious transformation God has brought in their life. But not just these men in prison. God has spared us. Might suffer a wicked life. When I deal with those men, many, many 
many, many times, I think very seriously, except by the grace of God. There go I. That could be me. In prison. But it's not. God redeems humbly. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Think of that as a benefit. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. Dear ones, do you not see that verses 3 through 6 is a product of David's meditation upon the phrase, forget not his benefits. David is not forgetting. David is remembering. Why is he remembering? Because he brought to mind the need to remember from the very act of knowing what it is to meditate. Meditate on what? Meditate on forget not the benefits. And he's expanding that into these areas. Now, when you get to verse 20, Note that he calls upon all to praise the worth of God. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his host, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What's happened? Out of the fruit of his meditation upon the benefits of, the, of God, upon his life, now he is receiving fuel to give praise to God. It grows out of consideration, consideration of those benefits. That has motivated David to praise God and to call upon others to praise him. Genuine praise. Not just the lips, but the heart. Now, turn with me to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. I said, I will guard my way that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muscle while the wicked are in my presence. I was dumb and silent. I refrained even from good and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Do you see the results of what was going on in David's mind and heart as he thought, as he meditated upon the condition of others? But David turns it into a very, very, very practical prayer. Lord, make me to know my end. I've been thinking about the end of others. But now let's get personal. Lord, help me. Lord, calls me to think about my end. Personally. What is the extent of my day? Cause me to know how temporary, how transient I am. Isn't it amazing how we can let that thought leak into our minds? It's 
somehow we're going to live forever. Well, we will as believers. But I'm talking about, we just kind of, we know it's not true, but we just sort of let that thought leak into our minds that I'm just going to be here all day long. In seminary, there was a professor who, according to what the scripture says about our days, being 70 at the most, actually took a series of calendars and on each day according to the limit that scripture gives for our life. I forgot the red hand corner. It said, so many days left. So as each day as he looked at his calendar, up in the corner, he calculated that he would probably live beyond that. But realistically, according to the scriptures, he would have this many days left. Sober, practical reminder of how frail we really are, how temporary we really are. But how did David come to that thought? It was a fruit of his meditation. Meditation led him to think about his own temporariness and to break that. More attention here. So, do you see how David meditated? Do you see the fruit of his meditation and the examples that we can see? Thomas Manton was a Puritan. Thomas Manton said about meditation it is rashness to pray and not to meditate. What we take in by the word we digest by meditation and let out by prayer. Let me repeat that. What we take in by the word we digest by meditation and we let out by prayer. Men are barren, dry, sapless in their prayers for the lack of exercising themselves in holy thoughts. Turn with me to Psalm 45, 1. Psalm 45, 1. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue, the pen of a right ready for writer. Well, let's make some application. Let me give you the first application. Of all the activities that we could participate in, in a given 24-hour period of time, there is only one that will pay the greatest dividends, both in this life and in the life to come. Just one. Spending time. How many activities are you going to be involved in today, tomorrow, the next day? Buying groceries, running errands, uh, ironing, uh, check the mail. Uh, there's only one activity that will be beneficial, both for time and eternity. And that's the time you spend at home. How much time will that be? Will you benefit? So, well, I, 
I just have so much to do. You know, Martin Luther says, I have so much to do today. I must spend the first three hours in prayer. That's a perspective, isn't it? He says, because I'm so pressured and I have so much to do, I better give three hours to prayer. That way I can benefit better from doing the other things I have to do. Most often we say, I just don't have time. I'm too busy. I like to use a little illustration. Perhaps you remember I've used it on other occasions. About time and the use of our time. And this little illustration goes that this guy goes in and buys a, one of the large pieces. And uh, so the guy that waited on him says, you want me to cut that in uh, six pieces or 12 pieces? The man says, Oh, you better cut it in six pieces. I don't think I could eat 12. <laughs> and what's the point? The point is this. God gives each of us the same size pizza every minute. How are you going to slice it? That's what counts. How are you going to slice it? There are those unforeseen demands that Come upon us, interrupt our planned schedule, a text that comes, Vladimir's in the hospital, and you drop what you're doing and you are seen. But the fact remains that for the most part, our time is our to choose how we will spend it. How we will spend it. Eating and sleeping are not only beneficial to the body, they are a necessity. Much of our time is spent in working. God has ordained that we work. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But there is a day given over to the activity of both private and public worship. What a wise creator we have. By the day.
That's pretty serious. Our gracious God, we realize that we are weak creatures at best. We have the battle of our own remaining sin, which affects us in so many ways. Laziness, indifference, waste of time and energy. Help us, Lord, to realize the importance, the vital necessity of structuring and maintaining a time of personal worship. Reading your word, meditating upon it, praying, Lord, Help us to be structured in all that we do, but especially in the means of grace. We pray in Christ's name.